descend into the bowels of the earth with us, the world's premier spelunking podcast, the pod people. Do you guys want to hear a joke? Sure. Yes. What's pale, naked, and slides around on its belly like a grub, screaming incessantly? Danny DeVito? Uh, actually, it's me, Matisse Van Rossum. <laughs> <laughs> and we may be the pod people, but I am the mole man, Ben Sheets. Hi, I'm Cleveland Mosier, and it's my birthday, and I can die if I want to. <laughs> nice! I think that's the smoothest an intro has ever got on this show. <laughs> yeah! Good for us. <laughs> we did it, boys. All right. Sign- many, See you next how week. Many, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, k- kill it while it's good. Uh, how, many, how many episodes have we done? Like, several hundred? Uh, we finally got a good intro. Thank God. About fucking time. <laughs> We are creeping up on our 100th episode yeah. here oh pretty my God. soon. Sorry, it uh, just feels. <laughs> <laughs> and you haven't even been doing it as long as we have. I know, I know. I'm, I'm the baby on the show. Well, speaking of babies, let's start, <laughs> start talking about uh, our film for this week. This was my choice. And uh, we're going to be talking about the 2005 film The Descent, written and directed by Neil Marshall and starring a fantastic ensemble cast uh, comprised of Shauna McDonald, Natalie Mendoza, Alex Reed, Saskia Mulder, Mayanna Burring, and Nora Jane Noon. Before we carry on, can I get an explanation on the baby segue? <laughs> yeah, what? Absolutely not. Okay, cool. <laughs> Moving on. Sounds good. The Descent is the story of a caving expedition gone horribly wrong as the explorers become trapped and ultimately pursued by a strange breed of predators. Sounds like a normal Friday night for me. Oh, yeah. (laughs) 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 Insert slide whistle. (laughs) So, yeah, this was your pick. Uh, Yes. Why don't you uh, talk a little bit about why you chose The Descent? Okay, yeah. Uh, So, The Descent is personally one of my favorite horror films. I think that it uh, takes an extremely simple premise we've talked a lot about like how simplicity is best uh, a lot of times on the show sort of a singular location it's a very vast singular location but i think that this is also a really excellent example of uh slow burn storytelling where the monsters are not necessarily the greatest monster in the film also a fucking fantastic example of uh how to create a sense of claustrophobia in a film Uh, i think that this this movie at least always affects me in like a very primal way uh i always sort of uh, get swept up in it and the plight of the characters, <laughs> and I think that it is actually a pretty scary movie, too. Yeah, well, the shots they choose for them going through the caves are often dizzying and disorienting, intentionally so. Um, I actually heard Neil Marshall talk about how when he was watching the dailies for the sequences they shot, he would go out of his way to make notes of the ones that made him dizzy or uncomfortable or unsettled and he made sure to emphasize those shots in particular which works to a great effect you know the caves themselves are so disorienting and claustrophobic this movie has one of my favorite uses of like negative space in cinematography like so much of the movie is just like blackness with like one corner of the frame illuminated they shot a lot of this in in a studio they weren't actually uh uh, shooting in caves for the most part but just like the seeing some of the sets that they built and the way that they just like composite little sections of them into just like blackness it creates this sense of simultaneously being like too big for your environment and also like way too small the way that it plays with like scale i think is really interesting oh absolutely remember the first time i saw this film uh when i was just a wee lad it's probably in like eight or ninth grade just uh you know starting to get into like modern horror movies and uh what a great film 
And uh, it was years later I watched the behind the scenes and learned that that film was largely shot on on a set. Yeah. And it blew my mind because the sets are often well lit by flares or flashlights. You see yeah. all the rock formations in like rich detail. And this is this is no like Star Trek set. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, uh, uh you believe that you're you're deep in like the recesses of these caves. Well, that's the uh, thing. It's such a feat. When you say that a lot of it is well lit, I would say that it's believably lit. Yes. Because a lot of times you look at films where characters end up underground or in caves and there's just kind of like an ambient light that doesn't really have a source, but like you can see the whole interior of the cavern and stuff like that. And this movie is like the sources of light are the women's flashlights or their headlamps or flares or glow sticks. Always attached to the people. Right, exactly. They, it's like they are the sources of light. If something happens to them, then the light goes out, you know? And I think that that is a really great way of making you feel the same danger that they feel because you also don't want to be left alone in the dark. So, like, you're really hoping for them to make it out so that you are not like stranded deep beneath the earth in and, the and blackness. And what a feat for cinematography too. Like having all like the ladies lanterns and headlights and flashlights like like always moving around is going to make for a real uh, uh challenge. <laughs> all right, we're we're back. I don't remember what we were talking about. We had to take a break to play with a baby oh yes uh, oh yes <laughs> that that took instant priority yes um but <laughs> i think i remember okay um, get us I was, back on track uh, i was talking about uh how much uh, i was just i think i was adding to your point about how much of a feat the the lighting is in this oh, film yeah. and how much of a challenge i i you can only believe it would have been to shoot uh lots of red lights from flares and they tended to actually use flares to light the scenes it, it would seem I'd, I'd love to know like what sort of like lighting rigs they were using like off camera to simulate that for control in certain sequences well one interesting part of that as well is at a certain point you know the group gets split up mm -hmm. and with all the darkness it'd be super easy to not know who you're looking at but the way they do it is they have each of them have their own kind of color palette with the flare versus the torch light versus the glow stick versus you know even the camera has its own i mean know, the aesthetic to an extent that's a fantastic point and like the color palette in this movie in general is one of my favorite things is that like you said they don't make the lighting homogenous throughout the film even the flares are different colors like you have like orange flares and then like red flares and the glow sticks are green and then you know at one point they they one of them makes a torch so you've got like this this orange yellow light as well and yeah it becomes very very helpful in keeping track of who is who once they've all become separated because the movie is so disorienting and you have such a hard time keeping track of anybody's location that like those color hints are a very clever way around that because it would be easy for this movie to just become completely incomprehensible at times. Well, and that's the thing too, you know, they're all in helmets in darkness. It's hard to make out faces all the, the time. Um, so they do it really cleverly. And I think the other thing that works in its favor is uh, the sound design in this film. Yeah. In general, the sound design is what carries a lot of this film, I would argue, um, just because everything is so dark that you need the sound to contextualize things and to really add to the environment. There's so many great sounds between you know, the monsters or the blood splatters or the dripping you know, of the, the water in the caves, the way that sound gets kind of lost and echoes strangely, especially like once they get split up, sound behaves weirdly underground. And you might think that something's coming from behind you when it's actually coming from ahead of you. And the way that they do that just adds to the the whole overall disorienting effect that also makes it way, way fucking scarier, too, especially once the monsters show up. The first time I saw this movie, like I had always seen the previews and like I knew that it was about, you know, like 
mole people underground like attacking these spelunkers but i didn't realize until the first time i saw it like how long it is before the monsters actually show up that's that's a point that i'm really interested to delve in a little deeper on uh you know i think the claustrophobia of them being trapped in and not knowing the exit and not knowing if there is an exit is so horrifying that even though the the monster stuff is done really well it almost feels superfluous to an secondary, extent, you know, yeah. secondary. All that stuff is handled really well, but it's not the thing I find scariest in this movie. It's a way to raise the stakes, but yes. I don't I don't think it's what it's what the movie is really about. That's why when I said earlier that like the real monster of the movie is not the monsters, it's the environment. It's the cave. I forgot how much underwater stands on the shoulders of this movie for a lot of the same reasons (laughs) because like underwater primarily deals with like water pressure as being the primary villain first and then the underwater alien monsters second so i i like that that comparison between the two this movie has its fingerprints on a lot of media one that i think is very worth bringing up too is my favorite shot in the film it was so vivid in my memory the first time i watched it and that's uh the reveal of the underground dwellers the nosferatu the Nosferatlets or whatever you want to call them. And I think um, they're called uh, in the context of the movie. I think they're called the crawlers. I, I like that. I, I just call them mole people. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, either or. Yeah. I love the shot where they have the little digital camera recorder and we get that first reveal of them through the the night vision yeah. lens. And almost feels found footage kind of. Right. Or Outlast. Yeah, like that shot looks right out of like all of the um, like even the the marketing imagery for Outlast and like horror video games. There's a lot of like almost video game elements. Yeah. I think with this film, well, there's that, a lot of like like seeking around like a location and being that like, shot is you know, really a classic survival shot. Horror. You know, mm-hmm. it's you could point at like quarantine and wreck for doing very similar shots. Um, in the same manner, even with the green infrared stuff. And I think it's seen repeated so often is because it, it works so well. Yeah. Um, and this movie is a great example of it. I mean, it becomes a, a fantastic tool for, like, the characters finding their way around or, you know, one of the characters particularly using the camera as, as her eyes because it's so dark down there and, like, using the night vision to be able to see. Uh, I think that that's really spooky. Uh, and, I mean, what, like, what a reveal of, of, of a shot when you f- see the, the, the first of the monsters. I mean, I guess it's not really the first time you see them in the movie, but it's the first time you see them in their in their slimy glory yeah yes. it's the first time you see them clearly yeah um i love slimy how they they, are. they build them up you know you see glimpses oh my god from distances through the caves we're talking about favorite shots uh probably mine is relatively early in the movie when they first get into the caves get into the caves proper not like when they're descending down like the waterfall when they get into like the first big chasm and one of them like pops the flare and it's that wide shot and you see just like a figure off to the side standing and you think that it's one of them at first and then it like sits down and you can see that it's got kind of like pointed ears that shot is so uh so spooky to one me because they hide high. them in the background like throughout the, time, the film yeah. and there's yeah. there are several times like throughout the film where you'll miss them yeah um and you won't even know that you're looking at them one of my favorite shots is one of the characters is looking down the caves and they see a figure yeah and it crawls off and it's such a wide shot that it's so far down the cave that you can't really make out what exactly it is and it even plays into the story that she knows she saw some something she right. thinks it's a person yeah that they're trapped just... down in the cave and they think that oh there's somebody down here who can help us yeah it's like no yeah no, there is not <laughs> um i also love the way they move they crawl around almost like a komodo dragon yeah it at times it feels like their movement is almost like stop motion kind of like sort of, it has kind of like this jerkiness to it that yeah. i really that i really like there are a few sequences where they especially during combat where they drop the frame rate you can see that the frame rates dropped on the actors as well uh in a couple of a couple of sequences and i wish like they could have limited it to only the the creatures 
So we would have really brought that that home. But no, I do love like the way that they move and they got great actors to to play them and their makeup is so rich. Like some of those close up shots where you can see like the I like, always just, forget how good the makeup like, is in this movie until you get some of those like, close ups. Such rich biology. Like they're like the way that their mouths like open and like even down to like their eyes and the way that like they're sort of uh what's what's the term? But they have like it's like fish. It's like fish eyes or like crocodile eyes. Like yeah. they're they're kind of milky on the sides. Yeah, and then they have uh, colored contacts in as well, which helps. Well, um, yeah, you get the you get the impression that their eyes are are starting to become vestigial yeah. after yeah. after generations of evolution because they're blind. Mm-hmm. So it's like you they they kind of have like small eyes that are almost like closed up sort of. Man, they're so gross too. Like some of those close ups where they get like right up in the faces of of the women is like just really, really nightmarish. One of the other things I like with the monsters and when we see action with them, I was listening to a little bit of the commentary and uh, Neil Marshall in particular was talking about how for a lot of the fight scenes they did very minimal choreography because they wanted it to feel as raw and messy as possible. Yeah. And it really does. It feels very... Haphazard. Yes, haphazard and messy and yeah, unexpected. Brutal, yeah. yeah. And also, like... I think they do a good job of making like the creatures believably beatable too. Like they ha- they have sort of like a home field advantage, but you know like they do scrap with them. Like they're not just completely overwhelmed by the monsters. You know the fights are very chaotic and and sort of like tooth and nail. It's it's hard for me to pick like specific aspects of the film to to gush about. Visually, it's just it's such a feast. I'm having trouble like keying into anything specific to really. Well, here's really a question into. I have for both of you. We all have seen this movie several times at this mm-hmm. point. You guys probably saw this movie much earlier than I did. Do you think this movie has aged well? I do. I do. I, do. I think it's it's very clear. It's I don't want to use the word dated because I don't I don't think that this movie is like held back by when it was made and there are a lot of films like from this time that i think do not hold up very well you can identify when this film was made largely by the color grading especially early the on. outdoor stuff before they really get into the yeah. cave the setup yeah. leading into the cave it's it's so like color graded with that like early aughts like blues uh like those those blue colors like the trees just look blue anything that is that is naturally gray in those scenes has been color corrected to be blue uh i don't think it's to the film's detriment i think it's just a product of the time it was in and it does fit the theme and feel like our our protagonist is in a time of suffering yeah like and and in 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 remorse so like the enriched blue colors sort of gives us like a, a sense of like their perspective and how they're perceiving the world not necessarily how the world actually is So there's plenty of context for it, and it doesn't feel just like it was stylistically slapped onto the film because of the time it was made. So in that respect, no. I think that the style of cameras that they use still look fine. If I had any nitpicks about the film, or did you want to say anything else about like the film's like age? Well, I think it's aged very well. I think so too. Um, It has a timelessness to it where like outside of, you know, a few tertiary things like the camcorder that they use even some of the cabin stuff you really can't place this movie besides that i would say it dates itself only in like the level of technology that they have available to them and like their clothes a little bit like just their their styles like the the one irish girl holly you know she has like a very like 2000s haircut but other than that uh, I think that like the story and the horror is timeless. I do not think that that has aged poorly at all. Uh, when it comes to the story, actually, I do have like one very small nitpick. I think you guys are probably going to disagree, and I think that there's plenty of validity to it. But um, get ready to be dogpiled, man. Oh yeah, We're I'm coming. prepared. I'm prepared. I'm ready to fight. Um, uh, no, no, it's just. I would have liked to have gotten to know the characters a little bit more beforehand. I think Annihilation does this very well. It, you don't necessarily need more screen time to get to know these characters. And the movie does make 
plenty of attempts to insert backstory for these characters in dialogue. We learned that, like, uh, for instance, the the Irish character, that she um, was, like, climbing a cathedral and got caught at one point. We know that she's sort of a renegade. That's she's sort an of adrenaline her. junkie. Exactly. Yeah. Like, that's she, her thing. She's reckless. Yes, we know that about her, and each of the characters get their little moments like that. But I never felt, like, as much of an attachment to these characters as I did as, like, some of, comparably, uh, some of, like, the, the protagonists in Annihilation, for instance. I just adore like how that film gives us just these little these like brief moments just to let us know like this character was in an abusive relationship this character lost someone this character has cancer and like what these things mean for them and it's enough for us to like sympathize with them just just a little bit because in this film I don't I just see them as like I saw them largely as strangers throughout the film so like their deaths didn't mean as much like, didn't have as much, like, personal impact to me. I felt like they have a lot of gratuitous impact, and they're very powerful and shocking. But when it comes to, like, feeling for these characters, they make several decisions that are also, like, reprehensible, and it's with intent. It's not the usual, like, don't go down that hallway kind of bullshit. For instance, when, um, you know, we we learn that, uh, I can't remember her name, but the, the person who planned the party, uh, or planned the expedition, um, uh, Juno. Juno specifically picked out, like, this cave that no one had explored before, deserves to die. She's just killed her friends, like, in doing something that reckless. Well, I mean, and she literally kills one of them on accident later. Yes. I mean, she's... And it's all thematic. If like, like if this if this film has a human villain, it's her mm-hmm. for sure. And I think that you're supposed to feel that way towards her. I agree. I, so I, I agree as well. The problem is that the friend that she kills, I haven't had an opportunity to feel for. I haven't had an opportunity to like. I kind of like the ambiguity because you know she is seen as a villain in some respects. In you know that she brought them to the cave. And she accidentally killed one of them. But only a scene or two later, she's the hero. You know, she saves the others by killing a couple of the crawlers. Right. This is you true. know, it, there's an ambiguity to yeah. it that I really appreciate. At least a human realism. Well, that's, um, I agree. Like, there's always intent behind her character. And she is very believable. I, I, I definitely agree with that. Like, her, her rationale for bringing them to that location is it's very selfish, but it's very human like well, it's, that's you the know, thing. like, like yeah. they want she wants to have them all come together and like discover this location like selfish is selfish is kind of like her core character mm-hmm. trait and in the movie it is human and it is flawed but uh she's not evil like and her character is probably one of the most fleshed out the rest less so i, I felt like they were almost more just like cannon fodder like well like, i think in a way i think in a way they kind of are like the the movie is really or the story rather is really hinged on the tension between Juno and Sarah, our protagonist, because mm-hmm. they they have conflicting motivations. Yes. And and so a lot of the character drama comes from how they clash because we see at the very beginning of the film the car accident that kills Sarah's husband and child. And so, like, the rest of the group, when they get together to do, you know, this this spelunking tour, they think they're going to, like, an easy cave. You know, this is supposed to be, like, good for them. You know, they always go on these adventures together, but it's supposed to be easy. It's supposed to be fun. It's supposed to, like, help Sarah kind of, like, come back to you know, the real world and work through her grief, whereas Juno selfishly wants to be sort of a hero, wants wants glory, wants them to discover a, a new cave system, you know, so she doesn't really have Sarah's best interests at heart. We also get a really nice piece of backstory, circumstantial narrative. Did y'all get the impression that Juno wa- had an affair with our, our protagonist's husband? Interesting. Because there's a scene Mm. where someone says to Juno, you know, she lost a lot in that accident. And Juno says she's not the only one. She says we all lost something in that accident. Right. Which. That's the that's, context clue that I get out of that. That's interesting. Is that they were having an affair? I I, that, I could be wrong, but interesting. That's not exactly what did, how. What were y'all thinking it? that was? I read it as Sarah's not the same after that. Oh, that she you just know, lost they, a friend. You know? Yeah, that yeah. they. That, yeah. Interesting. I like the ambiguity um, there. I kind of read it in a similar way, but also that that's more of her being selfish and making it about her. 
it's like it was a, well, either way that's was, the case yeah right it, like, it was it was traatic for all of us it's like well bitch no you're not the one who lost uh, a yeah, husband like lost and family, a child yeah. but it's like say like uh, why is she the only one who gets to mope we all lost something you know like that's kind of how i read it i yeah. i think you make a really interesting point with the characterization stuff um it's definitely worth unpacking i don't know if i really completely agree i think this movie is very economical in how it sets up characters and a lot of character development is through actions within the cave which i really appreciate they do the classic almost trope of starting the film with a very loaded emotional scene you know with the death of sarah's fiance in a reminiscent way to something like midsummer where like it has such an emotionally loaded scene that it colors a lot of the rest of the movie and that the Um, character goes into a a traumatizing event already traumatized but the interesting part of it is this loaded scene makes it seem like it's going to be very sarah centric once they get in the caves it's about all of them and in that respect i i kind of agree with you cleave that like the characters can feel a little underdeveloped because they're all given a little too much focus rather than you know giving specifically Juno and Sarah more focus but I don't think that's too much of a problem overall because a lot of the character development does happen organically in the caves in seeing who is skilled at certain things who's adept at certain things and so on I think you're very right it is a very subjective point it's personal like we know like what I would want out of the movie a key point for me to bring up actually is associated with Sarah and that is her traumatic event is one of the first things that we see for her we only get a brief moment with her and her fiance like out hiking before the event you get the white water rafting too right we see her like happy but we don't get to know who she is before this event i don't think that that's what it's about i don't think that her life before this matters in the context of the story i I don't think i would like that exposition no i don't think so either i actually like that it starts with that like traumatic event it's like okay yeah we don't get to know her family but i don't think we really need to you don't you we don't need we don't need to to like see who she was before to know that she is irreparably damaged by seeing her husband and young daughter die horribly. It's a structural right? thing in the same way as Midsummer in a lot of ways. You know, like we don't want to know the family right. that dies. You know, it's loaded because it's subjective through the character who's being traumatized, which in this case it's Sarah. Less so about the the relationship itself, but more about how it affects her. I agree. I mean, I don't think you're wrong, Cleveland. Like, there are definitely a couple of the characters, two in particular, who are pretty underdeveloped. I think that largely they do just kind of serve a purpose of, like, bodies that, you know, people that need to die. <laughs> but, you know, I think that Juno and Sarah get a great amount of, of character work. And even, like, Rebecca and Holly, I feel like I know those characters, too. Like, we get a lot about Holly being the adrenaline junkie the risk taker she's the one you know she runs off at one point recklessly because she thinks she sees daylight and falls into a hole and breaks her leg which is really where like the stakes start to increase exponentially you know because the the cave-in has already happened they're already trapped and then one of one of their party has crippled herself and rebecca really like once the cave-in happens really steps up and sort of like takes charge she's the one who climbs across that that chasm and like plants the pythons so they can all go across like she's the level-headed one the survivalist who's like we have to do such and such we have to do this and this and this if we're gonna get out of here like she's the one who while the rest of them are panicking is like sort of the steady center and like i feel like i know all of those characters the other two a little bit less but I don't hate it because I have four characters that I know and care about. In a horror movie, a couple people just need to be there to die. They just do, you know? Yeah. <laughs> That's a pretty nice like way to sum that up. And I think those are those all all those points make sense to me. There's not a ton left that I really want to talk about. One big thing, of course, is the ending. 
Yes. Um, but if there's anything else you guys want to cover before then... Well, actually, uh, yeah, I think that what I want to talk about transitions into the ending very well, okay. and that is Sarah's uh, continued dreams and hallucinations throughout the film. Yeah. I really like those sequences. I, I don't know how y'all feel about them. Deft. They're very subtle. They're very, you know, like lightly put in, and I appreciated that. I feel like they're beautifully abstract, which is what I would want from, like, dreams and hallucinations, but also, like, thematically very relevant. I love the first one, like, after the accident where she wakes up in the hospital and gets out of bed and, like, walks into the hall and, like, the lights start going out one by one and she's like running down the hall away from this like encroaching blackness then runs into her friend and kind of like wakes up and is just like screaming and weeping in the hallway i think that's just like for something that's in like the first five minutes of the movie i think it sets the tone really well and is also like really excellent foreshadowing like being followed by that blackness all of her hallucinations and dreams throughout the rest of the movie have that commonality of like the deep darkness. One yeah. thing I really would say about the dreams is I feel like they're really the heart of the story of the film. You know, in such a plot centric film to have those almost interludes as breaths mm -hmm. within the movie really helps develop the character of Sarah. They feel almost like chapter headers. Yeah, I would agree. Absolutely. And, and how and the way that they develop like how there's a certain degree of repetition but how they change to sort of reflect what's happening throughout the movie like a, a, a shifting pattern. One that she continues to see is like her daughter holding a birthday cake just which is a really nice image just like totally dark with just illuminated by the the single candle on the birthday cake and the way that we see that a couple of times and then at one point we see it again but then her daughter has the face of one of the crawlers oh that was fucking awesome mm -hmm. yeah because uh, you know I, I think that the ever-present like metaphor of this film is you know she, she's also we're also diving deep into like the caverns of her mind yes <laughs> you know like it's it's you know an exploration of the dark depths you know that that how her and, Dante's and, descent mm -hmm. into hell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When we're playing with light to use that birthday cake, to use that candle that represents like that that one piece of like hope almost that she has. You know, the it's, one it's light, light in the darkness. Right. And it's not a and it's it's not a real light. You know, it's it's something that she's she's just perceiving like from her past to hope for and that it doesn't exist. Anymore. And that like that the rest gone. of and that the rest of the memory does not exist around it, that it's a singular thing in a void. It is literally the one thing that she like keeps holding on to that she can't let go of. Mm -hmm. I do have one very minor gripe with this movie that every time I watch it still frustrates me a little bit and it's so fucking nitpicky y'all might think that it's silly but world building is very important to me and i think that there's one thing in the movie that is an example of inconsistent and kind of bad world building and i think that that is the one female crawler that we see when sarah fights her in the blood pit <laughs> That is, a, that is like, I mean, vi like it's, it's cool visually, but in a movie that has felt like so grounded in like reality for the most part and like real fears and stuff like that, that, that sequence just always like it disconnects me from it. Yeah. Cause like the, the crawlers are already so they, they almost feel like relatively like genderless. They're very thin and frail and, and hairless and hairless. Like they, they already like, I, I didn't really un understand why they needed to like, yeah, incorporate like gender between My the two. Point, exactly. Like they, I think that they, it's almost creepier if they're just like a singular, like amalgam well, or whatever. And you can't tell the difference. Cause like, especially like the, the female one is the only one that has hair. 
and just right, like, like ev- why just like evolutionarily like that would it just like they're all bald and like you said they're kind of like homogenous yeah. and sexless like, like they're all the characters look a feet they all look yeah they're um, night crawlers they're feminine. creatures you know to just like have so much of this like crazy visceral horror and then to find like this one monster that has like a wig on i also have a problem with the pool of blood like it's cool it's cool visually oh, i love the pool of blood but also like where's all where did all that blood come from <laughs> where, the the where thing about the, the pool of blood go? especially i don't mind it as much because i feel like the movie already escalates to something beyond reality when we first see the the crawlers close up sure and you know i i agree to an extent that like the first time i saw this and even now to an extent when you see the crawlers up close it divides the realism of the movie a little bit especially so when it gets to the blood scene but like for me that divide happens when you first see the crawlers close up so by the time you see the the blood pool i buy it more just okay. because it's it's already gone to a left turn over the top not the necessarily over the top but more Unreal, yeah, sure. Disconnected I mean, place. We, it's we incorporated don't... monsters into an otherwise. Do we like... see any of the other characters in that sequence, like to do with the pool of blood, or is it just Sarah? No, I think it's just cool. Sarah. Well, I think I think then there's justification. You for could it. argue that maybe it's a hallucination. Well, or at least it's hyperbolized. Like we're seeing it from her perspective, and she's she's being just like drowned and like soused in blood. She's just sort of becoming like her her most basic primal self at this point because she's been so like like tragically reduced that like all that is left is the primal much like the creatures like we've just been brought down to like this like proto-human level like like by the end of it and i i love that like that just that narrowing of like the spotlight like on our humanity and we see it like all of the the characters like slowly give away their humanity as well you know either by like turning against each other or you know b- via like whatever means and in their panic and fear they become these fight or flight creatures just like them they never I don't think they ever say it, but you get a vibe that the creatures were originally once those miners. Oh, no, I think they've been there a lot longer. I think they killed the miners. I I love that we don't know, though, like that it could have been that. I think you're probably I mean, like, OK, scientifically, like it makes a lot more sense if they were there before the miners. Yeah, like because then if, they, were, if they were the um, miners, then it adds an element of the supernatural, which convolutes the story more than it than I or, or at least pseudo pseudo science but i think but. there's ambiguity to it in a, in a respect because the the monsters the crawlers are already beyond reality in a strictly realism sense you know like i kind of I kind of disagree. I mean, one of the first things we see after the cave-in uh, is they find that old cave painting of the mountain, and they see that, okay, we know that there's a second exit to this cave. I did really like that world building. But... I, and I like that, and that means that it, people yeah. have been in these caves Before for thousands of years. Yeah. So I think it's not hard to believe that a tribe of people maybe ended up trapped in the cave or just, you know, lived in the caves for so long that they started to evolve to suit the caves. And that's how the crawlers are like an offshoot of humanity. The mine, like the, the miners or the explorers, like that they find the old helmet and like the old pythons and stuff. It's like, I just got the impression that that's why the cave has never been named before because they went in there to explore it and, a similar thing happened. They got killed by the crawlers. Yeah, I would agree with that. One interesting bit that I, I would love to hear you guys' thoughts on is when they find the, the animal carcass above ground. Is that from the crawlers or is that just red hair? I think herring? so. I got, especially when they find all of the bones, like where the crawlers have been like eating. We also hear her like audibly deduce that like the crawlers go to the surface to hunt. Yeah, that's that's the yeah. impression that I got too. That that they at night they go above ground, which to, is to cool. Hunt. Like almost all of like the the lore and exposition to the crawlers is speculative from our main characters. Like which is which is quite nice. That about does it for me. Um, well, let's talk about the ending really quick because yeah. I think it's a bit of a bleak ending. I think it's incredibly bleak. Yeah, but suitably, I would not want. I don't 
think I'd really want this film to have a happy ending. Yeah, I think there's a lot to say about it. What I love about it is, and y'all are going to hate me for this pun, but I, I, I do I do think it's the best way to say this, and that is, like, as an audience, we get to have our cake and eat it, too. <laughs> <laughs> because, um, uh, you know, we see her, you know, to, to kind of explain the ending briefly, like, we, we see her escape the cave through the second exit that Which was written in the cave painting or in and of itself, illustrated in the cave painting. In and of itself, like, an incredibly emotional scene. It's like of birth. Like, like, she, like, yeah. Like, crawling up this, this mountain of bones to, like, this single ray of daylight that is, like... The first time we've seen daylight in like well over an hour for the movie and then to like literally sort of be birthed from uh, from the earth like a like primordial being, yeah. you know, coming up out of the soup. Like it's so Covered cool in for blood that. and mm-hmm. mud and grime and shit. And I, I love like her reaction is so genuine when she finds her car and like she's driving on the side of the road. Like it, it all like feels like like a like she's escaped from this. Like you you really believe it like in her eyes. Like there's just this wild look and uh, it's it's so it's so like beautifully refreshing. And of course, then she she parks by the side of the road and just takes that moment to breathe. When a truck pulls by, hits the horn, and we're back in the cave. Well, and we, she turns to the right and sees Juno dead in the car next to her. Right. Okay, yeah, I forgot yeah. about that. And then she's suddenly back in the cave, and we have the birthday cake, and her and her daughter, and she blows it out. Well, no, it, it pulls back, and we see that, the ca- that it's not the cake, that it's her torch. Arch. And that she's just staring into it like we know that she's seeing her daughter as the sounds of the creatures getting closer, like, becomes louder and then cuts to credits. I love the ending. Here's, I love the ending. Here's why I think it's so great. And it, it is borderline a terrible ending. Like, if, if they had just tweaked a thing or two, like... This movie would have like I would have hated this ending. Any little changes would have been nightmarish. Do you Here, have an example of how they could have changed it to make it bad? <laughs> um, yeah, like uh, not including the birthday cake would have done it for me. I I would have hated I, it. I think you're right. Like if she'd looked over, seen her dead friend, and then just been back in the cave, like that wouldn't have it, been enough. I would I would have been annoyed. And uh, the reason I love it is we get so many other sequences throughout the film where she can't distinguish reality. The hospital being like mm-hmm. the best one. And And like she already feels like she's descending into the cave. And because of that, we still do not know which is the true ending. We do not know if she is still back in the monster cave or if she did make it out. Because here's here's my argument for her still having made it out and why I think that that is a very like reasonable like ending. She did get out. The truck goes by and she's brought into a traumatic state. And her traumatic state is represented by the cave. Even though she has left the cave, she will never leave the cave and i think that that's that's cool like she she still makes it out and the cave is just where she will always be because you know, she out now has like this horrible like post-traumatic stress over it and she's she will always be constantly brought back to that place and it's a place that we all have and that we can all associate with so i i love that there's an equal argument to be made for the fact that she is trapped in the cave and she's just imagining herself leaving but i i think it's more interesting to think that she does make it out we should emphasize that the descent two does not exist. Fuck that. Yeah, yeah. no. Get out of here. I don't believe in it. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Get get out of here with that that shit. I, like, and like, why stand, would you ever like put any like in a standalone hmm, respect? A movie. I very much agree with the ambiguity that you're talking about. I think it's a really clever way they approached it, and I think you make a really good point in that. You know, even if she escaped, she's not really escaping the trauma. And I think that kind of bookends with the beginning of the film really well. Yes. Um, you know, especially with the, the trauma that she experienced there. And it's because it could actually go either way that I love that ending. Because you know, I would have felt cheated if they had just they had just shown me that, like, she made it out and then, oh, wait, no, she's back in the cave. She imagined all of that. I would have been pissed. Like, if, if that was the only, like, way to interpret that ending, I would have been frustrated by it. It's a cheap bait and switch that's, then, and that's, that's all it is. Thank God it's more than that. Honestly, that's the only way that I've ever interpreted the film. I didn't really think about it the other way until you just said that. I think for me that I think she still is in literally in the cave, 
But I think that that is actually a really interesting read of it that I did not have before. And I like it. And I think you're right that it is ambiguous in a nice way that is equally bleak for different reasons. Yeah. And because you can you can have your cake and eat it, too, because you can choose yeah. which is like the better ending. And they're both bleak. They're both like they're still both like a horrible like thing to occur. I think and I love that. I think it. I should emphasize, though, that even in the reading of I think the more obvious reading of her not escaping the cave. Yeah. I don't think that's a cheap bait and switch. It is a bait and switch and they are overdone in film, no doubt. I think this one is handled very well. I think that having, like you said, like having the the final hallucination with the birthday cake as sort of the bridge between that is really good. Mm -hmm. And considering the fact that she is having hallucinations throughout the rest of the film already it doesn't feel like a Shyamalan like out of left field twist you know that just like feels tacked on at the end to surprise the viewer it feels thematically cohesive I really like that oh I, yeah I think I think you you bring up a very and interesting idea I think that there there is a way to do that that style of ending where it is there that is the only option and she is still back in the horror and she didn't actually leave like there are i think ways to do that that well but i think like as closely as it was done to but that you know, like uh, I, I, I i feel like it would have been difficult to pull that off and it, it's bleak but i think it also does possible it does have kind of like an interesting beauty to it because the way that she is so fixated upon that torch and the way that she sees it as her daughter with the birthday cake and that she is smiling and totally oblivious to the monsters and the darkness closing in around her that like even though she is about to die that she's kind of found peace before the end and, oh okay yeah that's pretty nice and you know yeah. like it's it's still it's still bleak like the way that we you know see the film end but i mean she's smiling she has, you know, whether whether she has reason to or not, like there's something she'll be reunited. There's something family, there's yeah. something that has like she she has found like found peace and has become whole in a certain way. And I don't know. I think that that's it's it's like a, a very nice, bittersweet, uh, yeah. bleak and bleak as fuck I'm, ending. I'm into that. I'm into that. Like uh, it's uh, I'm reading into that. I think, cool. I think well, you, you make a good point. It's a great it's a great fucking movie where you can uh, have so many different readings of something like that. Yeah. And it's a really rich yeah, subject and, material. And there's, for, there's enough for like, simple ambiguity. Of a premise as yeah, it is, like, too. There, there's enough allegory there that like you can get academic about it with like the dark recesses in the caverns of your mind, blah blah blah, like stuff. But also you can just enjoy it as like a cool horror movie, like with lots of like fucking awesome fight scenes. You can take it completely literally else. if you wanted to. Oh yeah, just going to be like cool, cool, cool cave horror movie and like have yeah, the have effects, a dandy time. The effects are great. There's not really I don't if there's any CG in this movie, like I didn't, I don't know if I spotted it. The practicals are great. Well, also, there is a lot of compositing you were saying. Yes. Ben, yes. You, were, you were looking into that. Um, a lot of the, the initial cave scenes where they're descending into the, the cave itself when they go are into the open composited mouth. in and they are miniatures, which I found really Dope. interesting. Blew uh, my mind hearing for that. example, even though the little waterfall that you get isn't actually water, it's a uh, salt and talcum powder. Awesome. Um, it so catches it, the light so much yeah, better. It yeah, it catches the light, and then when it hits, it like disperses a little bit, just like water. Um, it's really clever, really, really, really clever. And I think it's a great example of CGI used well to enhance yeah. uh, the, the reality rather than creating it. Right. Um, it's like the, the effects themselves are practical, but they're put together digitally. And I think that that's like the perfect way to do it like i'm a big fan of compositing when it's done well same i mean also like we haven't talked too much about like the gore in the movie it's a pretty gory movie lots of good blood and like really nasty like wounds and such wounds and yeah, yeah holly's bone coming out of it's, her leg yeah and, you know it reminds me of like the the new tomb raider games like that are like they just refer to them as like battery porn because yeah. it's just like so much just of like these like these characters just getting like just having the hell living hell beaten out of them well, it's like here just you relate with and so there's like this this like urgent feeling that comes with that and i mean it's it's tense for sure like it's definitely anxiety inducing in the best way um but also like i think that 
because that shit doesn't really start happening until like fully halfway through the film, it feels so much more earned by that point. It's not like the entire movie is like these people getting beat to shit and like torn apart. Yeah, it's it's never like problematic. Like it's always oh, no, like, no, 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 no. like you you feel for the characters. It's it's a realism thing, and I, I think it's like anyone. It's anyone it's can like get so that. much so much of the horror yeah. in the first half is like psychological and environmental, and then just like. All of a sudden, like about halfway through the film, you throw monsters into the mix and it becomes like hyper violent yeah. and gory. And, and it's always to serve the purpose of like horrifying and shocking the viewer. Not yeah. not it's never done for like the the enjoyment of gratuity. It's not exploitative in, many, in any Thank way. Thank you. No. That's the word. It's, um, it's definitely not that. Cool. Do you guys want to write? Yeah. I'll start since this was my pick. Yeah, I mean, I can gush about this movie ad nauseum. Uh, I love going back to it over and over and over again. I always feel like I'm finding new stuff, even just in this conversation. I think that I uh, realized some new things about the film that I hadn't before, thanks to y'all's uh, astute readings. Totally. So, uh, yeah, I mean, my... My one fucking nitpick is that little world building thing with the the crawler in the wig and the pool of blood. And no matter how much I want to just ignore it, it takes me out of the film for about five minutes every time I watch it. And uh, so, like, otherwise, uh, a perfect film as far as I'm concerned. I'm going to give it a four and a half out of five. Incredible film. Yeah, well, I think this movie is one of the all time best examples of claustrophobia in film. Um, it does such a great job of making you feel trapped. You know, I always have some tentative stuff about the crawlers just feeling a little superfluous to the true horror of being trapped, but it's handled so well that it's not really that much of a negative, even for me. Um, I think this is an incredible film. As we've discussed, it's a very rich film in terms of story. I'm going to give it a four and a half as well. It's definitely worth checking out, especially if you haven't seen it. Um, 15 check this years out. old already at this point. Uh, yeah, so check this out over uh, Neil Marshall's latest movie, Hellboy. Christ. Oh. Yeah, we didn't even talk about that. We don't need we to. We don't need to. We, go we, we have a whole episode, episode about yeah, it. Go listen to our episode <laughs> on Hellboy and see the, the descent of Neil Marshall's career. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, also a 4.5 from me for all, really all the same reasons. Like, there are several nitpicks, but they're largely just, like, my own personal taste. Um, well, I mean, it always is, but with clear acknowledgement of that. And uh, No, it has objective problems. <laughs> 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 I wouldn't get into that later, but uh, I, I love this movie. I'll gladly watch it again uh, just to look for more spooky Nosferatu boys in the background. 4.5. Cool. Well, oh, and that one synth track that keeps going through it. Sorry, we talked about the sound <laughs> design, but the score is great. It's extremely minimal, much like everything else about this film. And uh, just that one synth riff that just makes us it has just really feels like a, you're you're falling into a cave. It's very uh, John Carpenter. It's yes. got a kind of dun 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 uh theme that goes throughout it um yeah the, the score is great uh so that's an average of four and a half out of five pods for the descent this is our first unanimous rating in a good while extremely long yeah. time so not like we've been very dramatically opposing each other too much recently but two. uh yeah this is the first time we've been unanimous in a while i think that that's that's a very good thing because it means that we're we're not just like in a circle jerk like echo chamber um we, I mean, we do bring our own that? things to the podcast <laughs> thankfully yeah. like you know it's it's not all of us just like you know like like agreeing with each other non-stop which is generally boring Right. Yeah, I think it's nice to have disagreement. Opposing disagreement is healthy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, it's it's fun too. Like I think we usually come to agreements by the end of our conversations, and even when we don't, I think that's that's totally dandy. Yeah. Speaking well, of uh, uh, we, disagreements, yeah, we did some predictions uh, for the Invisible Man. Oh yeah. Let's. Uh, and the the numbers are now in, that. ladies and so, gentlemen. For Rotten Tomato score, uh, Tees, you predicted a seventy three. Cleve, you predicted wow. an eighty two, and I predicted a seventy. Oh, I hope I hope it's mine just because I, I want the I want the best for this movie. Well, you're in luck. It was yes. a ninety one. Nice, Holy even shit. better. Good, yeah. good, good. Deserves it. Awesome. Honestly, yes. I was oh, I, I was, want this uh, movie to do, do well so bad so we can get more like it. I was like, skeptical. Uh, I um, definitely lowballed. I th lowballed as well. I think I probably lowballed on box office as well. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, so TC said twenty four million. 
seems low. Uh, Cleve, you predicted eight million. And I predicted forty three million. I love it. I gave it a high rating, but I, I didn't think it would do well in the box office. Um, <laughs> it did twenty eight point two million. Holy shit! Yes! Yes! So you were pretty damn close. Good. I was um, close. I wish that was a little bit higher. <sighs> um, but honestly, I I kind of wish you had won that one yeah, too, Ben. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. The yeah. more money, it makes the better. Yeah. But that's I right. Will, you did, yeah. I will take that point. Hey, that's and that's still not bad. No. Like yeah. that's that's yeah. not bad. I, I I don't know if it's like it's good like from an executive perspective and that's well this movie was very cheap to make it was like five or six million and for like so it made its money back and for like a late february horror release that was pretty good fantastic yeah for sure good good Um, that means more like it excellent but yeah, that puts uh, everything about this movie great. Uh, that, that puts movie great. you at three T's. Okay, Cleve, you're at four, and I'm also at three. Okay, so it's a it's a it's a tight competition Ooh. here. What were uh what were our bonuses for this one? The our oh, preliminary sure. ratings. Uh, so just uh, in case it comes down to that, I always like to know. I rated it four and a half. Yeah. Yeah, four and a half. You predicted you would give it a four. Uh, Cleve, you predicted you would give it a five, and you did. And I predicted wow, really? I would give it a three, and I gave it a five. So <laughs> I, I remember now, like I was, I was extremely hopeful for this movie, and I didn't, and I hadn't watched the trailer or anything. I just heard that like it was an Invisible Man movie starring Elizabeth Moss, and that that alone had me like thinking that there was like going to be like some quality elements to that movie, and I'm. Oh, I'm so glad. Well, I'm quality so glad. it was. Yeah. Uh, go back and listen to our Invisible Man episode from last week if you didn't. Or watch the movie. If it's still in theaters, especially. I mean, it's definitely still in theaters. Go see it. Yeah. Well, yeah. Go check it out. Well, speaking of in theaters, next week oh, we are covering the very controversial film, The Hunt, which is coming to theaters after being mm. delayed by... Four or five months. Six months. Yeah, 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 six months. It should be interesting. We'll go hunt those pores. Will the hunt be in a front? We did we did see a new trailer for it when we were in the theater for the Invisible Man, and I must say, weirdly, I'm less excited about it now after this new trailer. Interesting. They're definitely like oh, leaning more, they're leaning into the controversy. They're the trailer makes it seem way more jokey. Whereas, like, the last trailer, I thought it felt like a kind of dry satire, and now it just seems, like, more straight-up goofy. So I don't know. We'll see. It almost feels like it has its head up its ass a little bit. Like, that like, trailer. Like the dry satire thing, like, has been done, and sure. it generally, like, but when it comes done, to, like, but political well. stuff, like, cringy. So I'm, I'm more keen on this movie being, like, over-the-top and wacky, considering the subject matter. Like, I think it's a safer, like you know probably more entertaining at least take and i don't want to be like annoyed about like political commentary and in like a a, a horror movie for, well for I, an hour I think we talked about this a little bit when it originally got uh delayed the original title for the film was red state blue state right so oh knowing God, that yeah. i was never expecting too much subtlety that's, from the, honestly from the that's beginning. a fair point that's a fair um, point we'll see i but, the that preview made it seem a little bit full of itself. Like, ooh, look at us. We're the most controversial I, movie in the world. Without knowing that, like, red state, blue state fact, like, I, I will say, like, I felt the same way off the first trailer. That you it were did. really off put from yeah. the No, I did, yeah, I, I, didn't, I did not want to see it. I didn't want to cover it on the podcast. Like, it's not the kind of subject that I would really want to. Mm, yeah, well, mm, I, I have been excited personally. since the first trailer. I think it's a really fun premise. I'm and, intri- I'm uh, very intrigued, yeah. So I'm I'm curious, but check back in for our full thoughts next week once we've actually seen the movie. The last little bit of housekeeping that we have to do, as always, is we got to get paid. We got to get that bread. We got to get those shiny rocks. Cleveland, who, who's our sponsor for this week? This sponsored week. Let's try that again. <laughs> Two great stars. This this episode is sponsored by the the new hit track, uh, "Pool of Blood," brought to you by the band, the Crawler and the Wig. <laughs> Which are two things you said earlier on the podcast that I thought would sound like a good... I mean, yeah, that's our sponsor, and the track sounds amazing. What genre uh, is that? It is uh, a death metal uh, bluegrass fusion. Uh, hence, Pool of Blood, and it's, it's Crawler and the Wig. 
like so it's like it's like a panopticon situation there's a lot of like banjos like over like the sounds of like droning bass and like 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 wacky like like massive like like uh what's the the, like the blast term? beats blast beats that's the thing it's exactly what i was looking for yeah like like i went ba like banjos over blast beats i heard they recorded it <laughs> it sounds like an, another amazing <laughs> bob <laughs> banjos over blast beats <laughs> I heard they recorded it in a cave oh, yeah. too, which is uh, the the reverb is really nice. Oh, man, now I just reverb. want this to be a real song. Like it I is. Go it is. It is I mean, yeah, Cleveland. Of course, of They're course. sponsoring us this week. Yep. Go on to oh, God, the sponsor shelf. The shelf is glowing. I don't like this. It's a the sponsor shelf is angry. Uh, I, I wouldn't know why. It's a totally real thing. Sponsor shelf. I I, I swear. Please, no, not the light. The light. <laughs> Speaking of the light you can head on over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts and light up the darkness by hitting five stars on this show. And also, while you're there, scroll some of your own cave paintings on the wall about why you love us and why you want to invite us to live in your house forever and ever. <laughs> um, you can also follow us on Twitter at pod people pod and over on letterbox.com slash pod people pod, where you'll find a list of all the films we've talked about on the show with our average ratings and links to the corresponding episodes. Uh, follow me on Twitter at deep state Aussie. I don't recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on Twitter at Mr. Sheets. <laughs> Whoa, hey guys. Uh, sorry, I don't know why I was inside the sponsor shelf. Wait, what's that pile of ash over there? Ah, uh, don't worry about it. Anyway, uh, hi, I'm, uh, Cleveland Mosier, and you can find me on, uh, uh, Twitter, occasionally tweeting for LightArc Studio. Also, you can join our, our It Stares Back Discord as well, or check out our game, um, that we are currently working on, and I kind of went around that from the back way, but you, that's you okay. You did it. You made I, I, it through I'm, it. Sorry, guys, I'm covered in mucus. Almost I, in I don't, one piece. I don't really know, uh, like, what's going it on. Looks I'm a little like disoriented. It, it um, has changed you forever. Sometimes yeah. you gotta go in the back way. That's why there's two entrances, just like the cave in the descent. Oh, oh dear. Um, I'm I'm so sorry. Uh, you can also find my work on ArtStation uh, as well. Uh, just, you just search Cleveland Mosher and check out some cool, spooky, sci-fi, dark, electric fantasy illustrations. And you can also buy prints if you want to. They make great cave art. Thank you. All right, well, uh, come back and hunt with us next week. But right now, I'm going to descend into this beer. <laughs> <laughs>